And last but definitely not least, I'm, I'm very, very pleased to welcome Joseph K. Kadif. <laughs> it's here. Joe, it's Joe. We call him Joe. <laughs> Just the average Joe. <laughs> uh, the title of his project is Against the Stream, Modern Buddhism and Global Power Systems. Woo! <laughs> <clears throat> Thanks, Sean, for getting everyone mystically warmed up for me. That'll be very helpful. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Thank you, Chris, for the introduction. And I also wanted to give a thanks to the other Chris, Chris Chapel, and Dermot Walsh, Lori Rubenstein Fazio, if you're here somewhere, and Dermila Patil, who's not here, but these are um, some of my professors who guided me through this program and made this all possible. And what I'll be presenting here tonight is, in many ways, a little sliver of the culmination of all of the learning, thinking, and of course, meditating that I've been doing, or been so lucky to do, uh, over these last two years in this program. So, um, just around the time that I was getting into uh, Buddhism, and for the record, this is a Buddhist uh, thesis, or it's concerning Buddhism, but I also think you can insert yoga in here in many instances, as I will. So around, around the time I was getting into meditation, yoga, Buddhism, I was also uh, inspired to take to the social activist scene, specifically um, in relationship to climate change. I was deeply inspired by a professor at UCLA who I took an environmental sociology class with, and I just felt like, man, this is the crisis of our generation, and we need to do something about this. And so I marched on Washington for uh, climate action against the Keystone XL pipeline. I wrote fiery opinion pieces to the Huffington Post and other newspapers. And um, I joined as many student organizations as I could at my uh, university to really start um, participating in this fight. So during this time of activism, I noticed two really interesting things. The first thing was that I'd actually heard all this in my environmental sociology class in high school. But I don't know, maybe I was that kid in the middle. Um, and somehow it just didn't quite click. So it didn't take me long to realize, well, the reason that it's clicking now is because of my new spiritual practice. I was practicing meditation and yoga every day. And without really thinking about it or being presented with graphs on a page or anything like that, I all of a sudden just felt a deeper connection and responsibility to myself, to all the people around me, and actually viscerally to the planet itself and all the suffering that I was seeing going on. So I thought that was really amazing and it was sort of my first introduction to this intersection between um, social activism and spirituality. Now, so that was me waking up. That's exactly how it looked, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my dad busted into my room and was like, what is going on in here? <laughs> so the second thing I noticed is that um, a lot of the activists I worked with were pretty burnt out, uh, pretty bitter. Not all of them, but a lot of them were pretty bitter, exhausted, and had really lost the heart that I think had originally gotten them into this mission. And really for all their talk of sustainability, I began to notice that the way they were going about this struggle um, was not very sustainable, and a lot of them lacked the inner resources to see their work to its fruition. So again, I noticed, here's another interesting intersection between spirituality and social activism. So at this time, I said, okay, well, I need to go a little deeper into my spiritual education. So this led me to different yoga practices, teachers, and eventually to Buddhism, and the idea of the Bodhisattva, which Sean mentioned earlier. So in the Bodhisattva ideal, the idea is that a being, just like you or me, a totally, totally normal human being, makes the vow to attain enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings, such that they can work for the benefit of all beings for as long as space and time remains. Big commitment. Um, even bigger than the social activist commitment, but much along the same lines. So I said, okay, here's finally a model for sustainable social activism. So I decided to try and take up that path. Another thing that was mentioned in Buddhism that really struck me was this idea of the three poisons. And I began to see how a lot of the uh, social activist um, causes that I was fighting for could really be traced back to these three poisons as they're described in the Buddhist tradition of ignorance, delusion, or misunderstanding of reality, greed, craving, attachment, and aggression, hatred, and um, aversion. 
And it was the Buddha who actually asked his disciples to incite an inner revolution within their own minds to go against this sort of habitual stream of our human cogitation. And so I thought, well, if we don't take care of this on the home turf of our own mind, how are we possibly going to create lasting change in the world? So again, I felt that there was a much deeper um, appraisal of just what we're up against in terms of healing the world. So as inspired as I was by this, these Buddhist ideas, and specifically the Bodhisattva ideal, I still felt that there was a little bit of a disconnect between these Buddhist philosophies and the world we were living in right now. And I was struggling to integrate this idea of the Bodhisattva and the idea of social activism because it just didn't seem like I was living in the same world as these ancient bodhisattvas from Tibet, Nepal, Nepal India, even China and Japan. So when I uh, came here to Kalanyu, <laughs> I began to notice that people had a lot of questions as we were talking about the Yoga Sutras. Well, yeah, yeah, Patanjali, but like, what about what's going on with Trump? And like, what about what's going on with the, uh, the climate change and white supremacy, inequality, um, all of these issues that are just bombarding our minds. It was as if we just couldn't quite close the uh, proverbial cave door on the world and say, you know, peace out, like, you know, like the yogis of old. So um, we needed to figure out this, this predicament we were in. So when I saw on the course catalog the Yoga Mindfulness and Social Change program here at LMU, I jumped on it and said, okay, we need to explore this. Let's see what people are saying about this. And the course was super inspiring. I learned so much from it. Um, and so many different perspectives were brought in, but I still felt in some way there was a divide between the spiritual philosophies and practices that were being brought in and the social action and the social theory that these presenters were using. And I felt that while, yes, we can say, okay, Buddhism um, says we should be compassionate and all these things, there is, I think, something a little more specific, maybe, that Buddhism says, and a little something a little more philosophically rigorous mm -hmm. that Buddhism has to offer for the... Uh, challenges that we face. So um, for this project, I looked into Engage Buddhism, because there's already a big movement of Engage Buddhists around the world, following in the footsteps of Thich Nhat Hanh and the, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh and the Dalai Lama, who are engaging these issues and creating distinctly Buddhist responses to the problems we face. So um, I looked at a lot of what was going on, and most of it seemed to stay within the realm of um, political activism. Buddhism and political activism. So, but as I went further, I identified um, some of the more ideological and philosophical um, issues that I think regular, modern uh, citizens are dealing with, and also specifically Buddhists are dealing with in a very real way in terms of their Buddhist practice clashing with the modern world. So, um, and also I noticed that a lot of times I think we think, okay, I have a handle on Buddhism, I have a handle on yoga, and now I'm going to like interpret social issues through this somewhat um, superficial understanding of these traditions. And what I noticed is that more often than not, it was actually these ideologies and the cultural influences of our time, they were impacting yoga and Buddhism more than yoga and Buddhism were impacting uh, these ideologies. So the three ideologies I sort of... Uh, weeded out were neoliberal corporate capitalism, disciplinary society, and biopower as understood by Foucault, Michel Foucault, and then finally scientific materialism. So all three of these ideologies work in concert with one another, and in many instances they have effectively co-opted uh, modern Buddhism by replacing modern Buddhism's specific uh, soteriology and ontology with their own ideological framework, complete with its own soteriology and ontology. And in terms of the um, oh yeah okay sorry right so in terms of the, the uh, Buddhism soteriology of achieving enlightenment through a series of uh, Buddhist practices and philosophies concerning unconditional compassionate love and the wisdom of understanding emptiness which is the non-inherent existence of self and world uh, neoliberal corporate capitalism. Uh, has replaced in many instances uh, this bo the Buddhist soteriology um, as a mere self-optimization exercise in service of market or economic competitiveness and a healthy and compliant uh, workforces for corporations. 
uh, in terms of disciplinary society, uh, Buddhism soteriology was reframed, reframed as one that perpetually seeks this transcendent goal of the most efficient, developed, and obedient social body. And underlying both of these soteriologies, um, scientific materialism had actually replaced Buddhist ontology of emptiness and Buddha nature, which speak of an imminent and yet transcendent field of infinite consciousness and potentiality as the ground of our being with the ontology of scientific materialism, which tells us that we're nothing but robotic biological machines acting on neurological impulses beyond our control, and that the world is nothing but dead matter floating around in a meaningless universe. Ouch. <laughs> so, um, in terms of the first ideology of neoliberal corporate capitalism, in short, during the uh, Enlightenment period, Western society underwent the process of secularization, within which social leaders attempted to rid the public sphere of the endless religious conflict that had plagued Europe for centuries by relegating uh, religious practice and thought to the private, personal sphere of social life, making sure that it no longer had anything to do with influential public debate, which now is exclusively the arena of politics, economics, science, and secular philosophy. So therefore, when uh, Eastern traditions like Buddhism came to the West, they were, just like all other religions, relegated to the private sphere of social life and portrayed as belonging to that sphere more than the public sphere of politics, economics, and science. And this speaks to the aversion I think a lot of spiritual practitioners feel for um, the political scene. But this is entirely a Western convention born of the Enlightenment period and has no basis in the countries from which uh, Buddhism came. Countries where the divide between the religious and the secular was entirely meaningless prior to the Enlightenment, I mean, prior to the European influence. So under the influence of this secular philosophy, and the political economic model of neoliberal corporate capitalism, Buddhism and yoga in many instances as well, um, have come to serve the market forces of this model um, as they fight for their survival in the marketplace, often molding themselves to corporate and capitalist ideals rather than native Buddhist ideals. And because uh, Buddhism has no institutional power in the West, this has made Buddhism in most cases completely politically impotent. For, because as long as Buddhism is operating within this conformist space of corporate capitalism and within its ideological constraints, it's just not primarily Buddhism, it's primarily a capitalist technique of self-betterment for market purposes, predominantly. So, um, in addition to engaging with social activist causes, which is definitely very important, Buddhists really have to interrogate their own practice to see whether they're operating under corporate capitalist imperatives and through a corporate capitalist subject subjectivity, or traditional Buddhist imperatives and a distinctly Buddhist subjectivity. So in other words, am I seeking to become a more compassionate and contented being who understands uh, emptiness and through that understanding feels empowered to serve all beings? Or am I just trying to make myself a better and more competitive economic actor through so-called Buddhist meditation techniques? Similarly, in the sphere of disciplinary biopower society, um, are, are Buddhists operating within this superstructure under the influence of its imperatives to create the most efficient, disciplined, and technologically developed society? Or are Buddhists operating under the influences of Buddhist imperatives that would urge them to deconstruct these conceptual frameworks enslaving us within a limited ideology that presents, that presents this incessant development and regimentation as the highest good, or at least a, a natural uh, evolutionary trajectory of human beings. Finally, um, as Buddhists operate within these two overarching superstructures, are they operating from the perspective of the ontology of scientific materialism or the ontology of Buddhist metaphysics? Are they operating from a perspective that reifies the substantiality of the world or one that deconstructs this reification? What is their view of consciousness or its origins? Does consciousness come from the body, your brain, or does your body come from your consciousness? Does uh, this podium and all the objects in this room, including our own bodies, have inherent existence? Or are they empty of inherent existence? Modern science, with the notable exception of quantum physics, and Buddhism have radically different answers to these two questions, each with far-reaching, and we might even say, life-changing uh, implications. So all three of these above ideologies, as informed by scientific materialism and the substantialism it propagates, are categorically um, opposed the traditional, the traditional Buddhist viewpoint of consciousness and emptiness. So, 
Bruh. Wow. <laughs> Philosophy. <laughs> and we might say, like, who needs that, right? Um, well, unfortunately, we kind of do because um, while it is important to march and get out and rock and roll and talk about how Buddhism supports compassion and some general notion of wisdom, um, we're all actually philosophers of our own lives, following whatever philosophy we've come up with over the course of our lives. And there's no escaping that. There's no a philosophical perspective. Um, and each philosophical perspective, whether we're aware of it or not, has vast implications. So uh, it should only take a second to look at our world and notice um, just how many problems have arisen out of these actually very deep philosophical ideas. So, for instance, look what materialism has done to our environment. Look what the false view of an inherently exi existent self and other has done in terms of warfare and violence around the world. Look what our idea of consciousness being reducible to the brain has done to our sense of self and our understanding of the limits of our human experience. So, for this reason, it's no surprise that Buddhist philosophy among the, uh, within Buddhist philosophy, among the three poisons I spoke of, it's actually ignorance that is always placed at the top, and it's the primary affliction, it's the primary klesha. So it is typically our delusion about the nature of the world that leads to our greed, to our aggression, or any other reaction we might have to the world based on the misunderstanding of how it actually works. So because Buddhist ideas conflict with accepted modern ideas as expressed in the ideologies above, we typically choose to focus on areas of Buddhist thought they're not controversial or contradictory to our modern ideas. But the fact is, if Buddhism is truly to become subversive and not just copy and paste its popularized slogans onto liberal social activist causes, it must step into these deep philosophical waters and begin to formulate responses to these ideological superstructures of modern global society that are truly founded in the deepest aspects of Buddhist wisdom. Buddhism can thereby extricate itself from the sphere of private, depoliticized personal practice and into the realm of public debate and politicization through their Buddhist practice. And through this, Buddhism may actually begin to shift the broader social discourses of our time and in so doing lead to profound and actually sustainable change for the better. So, how do we do this? There's actually been a lot of work on this, and in my thesis, I put forward basically a technique for each of the three ideologies. So for the first one of neoliberal corporate capitalism, the basic idea is Buddhists, and everyone else too, but we're talking about Buddhists right now, Buddhists need to interrogate their own practice and see, am I operating from Buddhist ideals, or am I operating from corporate capitalist imperatives? So then, that can shift the individual's Buddhist practice, and it can also incite action in terms of literal um, political action. Second, in terms of dis disciplinary biopower structures, um, this one's actually pretty interesting. I don't think anyone has experimented with this, so I'm really hoping to take this into workshops. Basically, the idea is that through Buddhist meditation, we, Chris, we attain this witness <laughs> perspective on the discourses informing our subjectivity. So that witness perspective does not have any discourses um, limiting it yet. And so from that perspective, we can witness those discourses and begin to untangle them through what we could call Buddhist deconstructive practice. So for, and for the last one, which I'm sort of the most pumped about, um, there are a lot of people doing some amazing work collaborating between Buddhists and scientists, but not in the typical way we think of it, which is measuring brain waves, measuring stress levels, Taking, taking a look at what Buddhist meditation does from a very objective, uh, third-person perspective. Instead, some pioneering Buddhists and science are looking at what Buddhism can tell us about consciousness when we explore it from a first-person subjective perspective. And within Buddhist philosophy and yoga philosophy, there's said to be a level of consciousness that we can clearly identify that's actually before what we would consider an ultimate or mystical consciousness that actually transcends the brain. So if we have a whole group of people experiencing that level of consciousness, which is known in Buddhism as the substrate consciousness, and they can corroborate that experience, that it goes beyond the activity of the brain, then we can have some basis for discussing from a scientific perspective a consciousness that transcends the brain, and therefore we have some evidence for consciousness transferring from lifetime to lifetime. So I'm excited about that work, and if you want to know any more about it, my thesis is on sale for $10.99. <laughs>
or an ebook version? There's an ebook version too, yeah. It's already on Apple. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? That's amazing. I got a tough one for you. Bring it! The tough one. Given all that you've said, would you support and or tolerate the idea of free, freedom of speech? Um, the short answer is yes. Good. I'd like, could you elaborate on that question? Well, on campuses across the U.S., the freedom of speech has been diminished mm -hmm. rather severely. Okay. And I'd like to think of the first one answer. Could you go to the prisons and get the um, anger lessened by, by the beautiful sounds? That's yeah, okay, I see what you're saying. Because we yeah. have a lot of people that are unhappy. So can we use these techniques to, yeah. to, chill, to chill the people well, out? One of it is freedom of speech is really under attack. In this country. Okay. Yeah. No. I mean, I think that I think that this this whole project is a representation of freedom of speech because Good. it's actually trying to be transgressive free speech that goes against these um, sort of invisible ideologies that govern our lives. So in that sense, I'm like behind a hundred percent. Okay. D dog. A couple of things. Just in response to the freedom of speech, um, we're talking about bodhisattvas. Um, actually, we're going to talk about a little bit the different rules, the different moral rules. And I was really, you know, impressed to see both presentations mentioning bodhisattvas and this idea. Um, a bodhisattva is not necessarily a special person. Anyone can make that vow. Now, if you're sitting around watching Kardashians, it's probably not going to happen. <laughs> but if you're actually making an attempt, you can make the vow. The vow fulfills itself just by the effort. So it isn't just Japan or China or ancient Buddhists. Anyone can do it. But it's very difficult. Yeah. And one of the things that's difficult about it is that you're looking to maintain a moral status that's just more than what you, other people expect of you. And regarding freedom of speech, and this is something I've been teaching the students and I, I make no uh, apologies for teaching it. In Buddhism, Right speech is one of the most important things. And if your speech is creating the causes and conditions which harm other people, then you are not practicing right speech. So the question that we need to ask is, can that speech, can the speech that is actively attempting to cause harm by a proxy to other people, should that speech be allowed on American campuses or on any campus? Mm. And I say, no, it shouldn't, ah. because it breaks those bodhisattva precepts. Mm -hmm. right. Now, that's my Buddhist perspective. Going back to, you know, you can't just wipe your hands clean and say, well, I said it, but someone else did something based on what I said, so it's not my fault. It is your fault. Mm -hmm. this, but pivoting a little bit uh, away from the political side, uh, actually not away from the political side, actually right in the political side, <laughs> the problem with Buddhism, in politics is that it becomes very individualistic, at least in the West. But it's not always been the case. In Asia, uh, monasteries were always a target for governments because they become, ironically, they become big and powerful and wealthy through not wanting to become big and powerful and wealthy by following certain rules and regulations that actually are very, very applicable to what the situation we have now. And this is something I think you should look at how does a Buddhist monastic complex and the rules underlying a monastic complex reflect the society that we can attain? Mm -hmm. And this actually was happening in Cambodia prior to the Vietnam War, in uh, Burma prior to corporate uh, land takeover. What we're seeing now in Burma is actually a response by government in cahoots with corporations to take land from uh, Muslims, from Rohingya, in order to give it to corporate interests. Before that happened, th that land was being uh, farmed and worked on a cooperative farming uh, model based on Buddhist monastic practice. That, those practices are vital if we're to sustain the environment that we have uh, in order to save with the environment that we have now because overconsumption and not wanting to admit that we have caused all of these problems is actually destroying.
So I think that's uh, the key thing in your, in your dissertation, to move away from the individual Buddhist and to talk about how groups of Buddhists can actually help to uh, make an impact. Yeah. yeah, one of the things I emphasized in my thesis was this idea that one of the things like you were talking about that gave Asian Buddhists the power that they had and the influence they had in their societies was this institutional power, which is, of course, lacking in the West right now because we don't have these monastic institutions. Right. Robert Thurman talks a lot about this and how he thinks that the future of Buddhism in the West is largely dependent on bringing these institutions into being in the West. Mm -hmm. And I don't see how Buddhism could become long-term subversive if it does not have these institutions supporting it. And in terms of the Bodhisattva, yeah, I, I definitely wanted to ment uh, emphasize in the beginning that yeah, anyone can take that up. And um, and the other, and like I said, also um, these Buddhist monasteries in Asia were performed a lot of the secular functions that we now think of as being non-religious, and that's totally a, a Western convention that I think, in some ways, we need to re-examine. Well, just to follow up on that, and thank you for, thank you for that answer. Um, so in Foucault's theory of power, I think I asked this a long time ago, I'm curious what you think, because power gets instantiated in certain organizations, institutions, people, and then it, it's there for a while, and then it shifts. It can, go, it can move to another institution. It's fluid. Um, it becomes instantiated in one place, and then it can appear in another, um, uh, in war, in, in organizational restructuring. There's so many different ways that power is just shifty at this thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, well, I guess the question I have, and Dermot made me think of this, is, is how, when, you know, this becomes subversive, and it shifts structures, how then does it maintain, it, it, it's no longer subversive, but institutionalized, and then it, it has the power. Uh, then it has it, yeah. So how does it how does it then retain that countercultural edge without being countercultural and, and still remain ethical? You know what I, mean? I, I think it's honestly what what Dermot said. It's the it's the we say we throw out the word ethics, mm -hmm. but in Buddhism, ethics has a very specific understanding. And so there's actually a scholar whose name I'm blanking on right now, but he looks into the intersection between Foucault's idea of power and his idea of self cultivation in a way that can actually bring about some sort of personal liberation from Foucault's perspective. And he connects that to the monastic uh, practices of the Vinaya. And he believe, and basically his thesis is that um, because of the nature of the vows, because of their orientation and the fact that the whole group is moving towards that, that power and that disciplinary structure actually works as a supportive ground through which individuals can attain a level of um, self-freedom. So. Yeah.